days and PRD as we used to know them and call them in the past. No exhibition anymore. I hope you had a chance to see the very interesting exhibits. Uh, we are a bit far from the center, but still I think we have a good gathering of people here to follow the session on hydrogen production. So the way we're going to do this, each speaker will be coming here to give his uh, presentation, be seated in order to be able to follow the other presentations, and in the end we'll all sit here along with an invited researcher uh, to discuss on where research should be going. So, our first speaker is actually will be joining uh, online um, to present Project Refine is uh, Anders uh, Oedegaard of Sintef. I hope he's online and that he will be able to give us his presentation. Hello, Nikos. Hello, ev everybody. Thank you. Hi, Anders. <laughs> you can How's hear me and see me? How is the weather over in Norway? Uh, I can show you outside. Oh, boy. Look. Oh, boy. It's much better here. <laughs> it's, it's darker here, of course. <clears throat> right, but that's good. So, uh, looking at other sessions, maybe you want to just very briefly present yourself, also Anders, and then proceed with the presentation. Thank you. Yes, I can do that. Thank you, Nikos. Also, thank you for the invitation to uh, present the project here. I'm very sorry I can't join you in Brussels, but uh, I guess we all are quite used to now this way of joining digitally. <clears throat> so, my name is Anders Ørgård. I'm with Sintef here in Norway, which is a non-profit research organization. So, I've been involved in lots of hydrogen projects in a couple of decades now. Uh, happy to be able to coordinate this refined project <coughs> with uh, the partners which I will present now further on. So, um, as said, I will present now the uh, refined project. <coughs> I think, uh, is it so that you can shift slide when I say? So, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, I'll, uh, this is a 10 megawatt PEM electrolyzer project. It's, uh, it's situated at Shell's Energy and Chemical Park in Cologne in Germany. Uh, in addition to Sintef coordinating this and Shell uh, operating the plant, we have ITM Power who provides the PEM electrolyzer as well as the uh, balance and platen system aspect of this element energy are leading the dissemination activities while Sphera are doing environmental analysis in the project. The project was part of the 2017 call uh, under the topic demonstration of large electrolyzers for bulk renewable uh, hydrogen production. So. Uh, started beginning of 2018 and uh, formal initial end date would have been end of this year i'll come back to sort of delays and COVID, all that so we are now expecting a an extension until uh, mid 2024 of this uh, <clears throat> total budget is 20 million euros and the uh, clean hydrogen partnership funding is around 10 million euros um, again come back to the uh, percentage of implementation where we are in the project but uh, to follow the template here we would say we're around 60 percent on, uh, on completion of the project <clears throat> next slide please So, uh, the overall objective of the project is to uh, deploy and operate this 10 megawatt PEM electrolyzer in a power to refinery setting. So, this means supplying hydrogen to the uh, normal operation at the refinery of uh, Shell. There is an existing hydrogen grid uh, network at the site, uh, currently mainly um, uh, using grey hydrogen from reformed uh, natural gas 
Um, so in addition to using this green hydrogen in the refinery processes, we are also looking into provide primary and secondary grid balancing with the electrolyzer connected to, uh, to the grid. <clears throat> By doing all of these activities, we also aim to, and I would say we also already do, we provide input on uh, policy regulatory changes, which is needed now to accelerate the hydrogen market, which we all see. And I guess most of us know in which position uh, we are. Lots of interest, lots of projects uh, waiting to start. And um, we are happy to be one of the front runners in this area. So when it comes to one important aspect of electrolyzers, this is uh, first of a kind full integration of a megawatt sized PEM electrolyzer in a uh, refinery process plant. Next slide, please. So uh, here you see the uh, timeline of the project, how the progress has been from uh, initial Start first year 2018, lots of work has been into uh, design, uh, detailed design engineering uh, permit processes before we in 2019 could uh, have the groundbreaking ceremony and uh, from then on working on the uh, on-site building construction of, uh, of uh, the housing of uh, the electrolyzer plant. And meanwhile, ITM Power were busy manufacturing the electrolyzer, uh, electrolyzer stacks. Uh, mid-2021, we had a complete system in place and the inauguration was done uh, during the summer, June 2021. Since then, there's been system testing, uh, operation failure analysis, first hydrogen provided to the grid at the site was done in October 2021. So since then, this has been connected to the in operational um, processes at the refinery. Uh, next slide, what we so far have seen on general aspects, uh, risks of, of uh, risk and, and challenges. We see that uh, there's a lack of suitable and uh, tailor-made balance of plant components at this site. So also many of the challenges we've experienced in the project has been related to peripherals or balance of plant equipment. Um, there's lots of experiment or experience in uh, lower megawatt size systems but when you come up to higher ones there isn't yet um, uh, off-the-shelf balance of plant components and this also relates to all upscaling of system elements and uh, and integrate this with the electrolyzer plant therefore of course the overall costs are um, expected to be higher than initially planned. Um, that uh, also relates to the COVID-19 uh, restrictions and how we had to handle uh, travels and, and communication across partners. Uh, I will also now uh, want to say I'm very impressed by the cooperation between Shell and ITM how that has been. Uh, we can come back to that in the next slide as well. Another thing what we say, see is the challenging uh, electrolyzer prices currently, currently seen. <coughs> um, yeah, this is part of a uh, summary uh, report we have made, document where we see lessons learned so far in the project. What I mentioned here, uh, the first two bullet points goes into sort of Shell ITM collaboration. We see mature industry at the refinery versus uh, relatively new technology when it comes to PEM electrolyzers and uh, upscaling from small to larger electrolyzers, uh, bringing together small SMEs um, 
versus uh, mature, larger industry, where both learn from each other. You have to meet in the middle uh, to be able to realize such a pilot plant. And the learnings on both sides have been enormous, I would say. Uh, as I said, I'm impressed by, by the two actors on how they have been able to um, realize such a project and a plant. There's been many actors involved. Uh, you have everything from the engineering, uh, design, supplier, subcontractors, and then of course all the, uh, at the end, those who are going to operate the plant at the site. This also relates to sort of additional competence required during such a, a process, which sometimes are a bit outside of the smaller scale activities when it comes to legal side, permitting, industrial scale, procurement of both components, electricity and all that, uh, much which is outside of uh, many of the actors' uh, knowledge in this uh, area. Next slide, please. When it comes to exploitation and expected impact, so what you see to the left is a plan and uh, already implemented exploitation activities. So there's uh, lots of efforts needed to be done to assist in realizing these large scale electrolyzer coming into uh, operation. So mentioned somewhat a bit earlier as well, um, input to to uh, regul re re regulatory, regulatory and, and uh, policy activities. And that will be ongoing both now towards the end of the project and also uh, beyond the project. Also linked to this is the impact. So I showed you on the previous slide lessons learned, uh, which are not only meant for ITM and Shell and project partners, but this is something we'll disseminate Further on, of course, in um, in um, in different um, uh, events uh, and uh, to to different stakeholders in uh, in the area. Um, what we are very happy to see is that we've been able to continue uh, large parts of the consortium and the concept into this uh, scale-up project, refine two on hundred megawatt electrolyzer system also to be placed on the uh, Shell uh, Energy and Chemicals Park with ITM um, electrolyzers. Next slide, please. We have, of course, seen a huge interest in our project. It's uh, related to our excellent work on uh, all partners when it comes to visibility and activities on the area. We are, I would say most of us are well known in the hydrogen area. Um, as I said, Element 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 Energy are leading the, uh, the communication activities and um, we have had already a handful or more site visits at the refinery. The interest is so high that uh, Shell has to uh, limit this uh, in order to be able to operate the system in between as well. So there are, uh, depending on where they visit, but uh, sometimes they have to shut down the whole system in order to, to complete the visit. Um, been lots of high level meetings, uh, visits on um, politicians, uh, both uh, international, uh, outside Germany, outside Europe, and um, of course, uh, local politicians and activities as well. Uh, you see below here a uh, series of uh, activities and, and uh, uh, work we're doing on communication of this. And I would say we are very visible, uh, especially of course in Europe, but also international on our uh, activities and, um, and what we have achieved so far in the project and we're looking forward to present even more on our um, our uh, experiences on the performance uh, when we're in full operation now from from early next year 
So, I, with that, I think I'll conclude. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to present the project and looking forward to uh, joining you further now in this session. Thank you very much, Anders, for your presentation. Indeed, you can see this is a, a very good example of a, a demonstration project. It has the right amount of problems and issues and challenges that gives our role, uh, that makes our role significant in, in funding this type of development and collaboration between different industries. Um, are there any questions from the audience to Anders perhaps on the Refine project? Yes, the gentleman at the front. Thank you very much. Uh, Rudolf Sauner from Verbund. Uh, I was wondering, uh, did have uh, Brexit any influence on funding and on the timeline of the project? With ITM being a, a British partner. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. At least yeah. from the point of view of the JU, none. But go ahead, Anders. Yeah, no. Um, actually, I would say the same. So, uh, I would say the, the COVID situation um, was more of an impact and perhaps that overshadowed everything else. Uh, if then there's been some practicalities and, uh, and uh, sort of time, timely uh, problems for, for ITM uh, on this. But uh, funding-wise, it's not been a problem as this was continued uh, as as EU-funded project. Right, so, yeah, we managed to uh, overcome this. Um, Anders, you, you mentioned very rightly, I think, that uh, some of the issues are actually coming from the balance of plant component. Do you think that maybe one day the JU should start looking at funding the development of the balance of plant as well? Yeah, don't you have a call now coming up after Christmas? So uh, I would say uh, it's uh, perhaps a bit late coming on with a new topic now, but that is for sure something which is uh, very important and uh, not sure if you need sort of a separate project on, on developing uh, distinguished components, but uh, have a very high focus on uh, balance of plant and surrounding integration with, with uh, end use uh, in uh, such projects. I think that is of uh, high interest and, and value for further deployment of uh, large systems. Mm -hmm. and, and you showed in, in one of your slides, but you didn't elaborate how the electrolyzer integrates with the power demand of the refinery and how at some moment that the refinery had uh, increased electricity demand, the electrolyzer uh, power was, was reduced. So yeah. the initial tests are showing the electrolyzer showing good dynamic operation characteristics. Yeah, uh, when it comes to such a industrial site, I would say I know mostly about this uh, shell site. So they have these power contracts and uh, you're within some boundaries of maximum, minimum uh, power uh, used at the site and uh, going uh, outside of these limits will um, You'll have to pay fees uh, for for this, and that's why one of the the uh, one of the usages here is to balance within those limits. So, if the uh, refinery itself has a high consumption up to the limit, then you will, uh, as you say, uh, shut down or run the electrolyzer on on low load. Uh, opposite as well, if you have very low electricity consumption uh, elsewhere in the plant, you will operate the electrolyzer at a high load to, to maintain consumption on this. And this, has, this we have already uh, proven and shown that works well. Um, and uh, the second thing which is now next up is this um, external grid balancing where there needs to be uh, some, some final test towards the uh, grid operator. Right. 
thank you very much, Anders. Please stay with us um, for the, the rest of this session. Um, I would like now to invite our next uh, speaker, Mr. Robert Bauchsteiner, to present the H2 Future Project. Robert, the floor is yours. And maybe, again, you can briefly introduce yourself before the project. Yeah, my name is Robert Bauchsteiner. I'm project coordinator and hydrogen expert at Verbund. Verbund is Austria's largest utility electricity provider, mainly focusing on uh, hydropower. And yeah, within the next 10 minutes, I will present to you H2 Future. Uh, these days we have heard a lot about the future, about what will happen in hydrogen valleys, in new systems in cars, trucks. What I'm telling you now is something about history, the history of hydrogen, the short history, the recent years, because this project is already closed. It happened, really, in Austria, in the city of Linz. And there are some interesting aspects which I will introduce to you. So we started in 2017. Uh, with the project and it, la it shall have lasted until end of June, but COVID and other issues uh, forced us to extend it to uh, end of 2021. Total project budget, thank you, Nikos, 18 million euros nearly. The European taxpayer. <laughs> uh, with 70% uh, of, of, of funding, uh, nearly uh, 12 million. Uh, stage of implementation, of course, 100%. We are closing the project right now, distributing the last rate. And, uh, but we will go on and I uh, will tell you how. Yeah, here are the partners from three countries, from Austria Verbund. Uh, First Alpine is the, uh, a big uh, industry in, in the steel part. Uh, in, in, in Linz, uh, situated, maybe well known all over the world, also well known in uh, USA. Uh, Kainz Met is our metallurgical partner. Uh, he, uh, the, the company, supported us as to uh, metallurgical aspects and how to roll out the system in the, in the steel industry. APG is our 100% total company, the TSO of Austria, distributing electricity across Austria. Yeah, and then we have Siemens Energy from Germany uh, uh, delivering the electrolyzer system, a PEM electrolyzer system, and TO, TNO from the Netherlands giving us the overall picture over the project. Yeah, we had 10 objectives defined in our grant agreement, but they can be narrowed down to two main goals. This is the design and the installation of a six megawatt PEM electrolyzer at the site of Linz. You can see a beautiful picture of, of our building. Uh, it's situated directly on the steel uh, production site, but it can be, it, it is visible if you go across the street uh, beside. Then, of course, not only building it, uh, operating it for two years and going through a demonstration operation with ambitious targets, was the second goal to be reached. So here is the easy part of, of the project, easy, uh, because yeah, it's, it's uh, about getting a permission from, from the authority, which was easy for us, because we are already at the steel production site. There is lots of hydrogen there. There's lots of oxygen there. There's lots of pressure there. So the authorities were not worried about anything else we got the permission quite easy after one year. Uh, of course, our colleagues from First Alpine were familiar with authority engineering, and this was not, not difficult. Uh, we had a building to be built. Uh, we had an architect. Uh, it's a beautiful building. It's eye-catching, and it has a reason why it has such a top, because uh, hydrogen is the lightest element, and it will gather at the top of the roof uh, if it comes out of the plant and easily can be removed uh, outside. 
And we had Mr. Canete in this time responsible for energy in the European Union in a visit in, in, in Linz. Uh, we had a big event there. We, had, uh, we contributed also to uh, the elaboration of, of, a, of a study uh, which was done in Tokyo with the main part in, in this place. And yeah, finally, we constructed a plant ground breaking ceremony our CEOs having a party and yeah, as I said, not so difficult part, but then yeah, the plant has to be started and this was the case end of 2019 where the first cubic meters of hydrogen uh, were produced, also bosses coming across and looking what, what happened there. We had afterwards five months commissioning and yeah, and at the beginning of 2020, right before the outbreak of the pandemic, we started operation. It was a good luck because it, the plant can be operated remotely. Uh, of course, still there was personnel on site to take care of the plant, to look after it. But anyway, the plant was, was operated according to plan. More or less, we had at the first time of, of this demonstration operation, five, straight, five uh, use cases to be, to be go going through. We had a, a stress test. You can see a, a graph right above. This is the plant frequently going up and down. Uh, we wanted to know how the system reacts. It was quite good. Then we had a con kind of a continuous operation for a long time uh, at more or less six megawatt. Uh, and this was, of course, no, nothing special, but it was uh, essential to get some parameters out of the plant, e efficiency, uh, first, first uh, operating parameters. Then the third use case was the qualification for the grid service. So the plant has been qualified for primary, secondary and tertiary balancing power delivery in Austria. It is connected directly to the Austrian uh, power grid and can deliver this energy, positive and negative. Then we had two use cases at, uh, correlating to, to the steel industry itself. Uh, for the future steel industry, there will be an uh, electric arc furnace uh, consuming lots of electricity. So the idea here is to balance uh, the, the uh, power consume, consuming uh, according to, to this, this uh, line and also the introduction, integration to the current steel system was, was an issue. And then uh, end of 2020 we started quasi-commercial operation so the plant continuously delivered uh, uh, balancing energy to the grid and produced uh, hydrogen most cheaply, as cheap as possible. And at the end of the project, we had a final one month testing uh, about the plant itself, getting parameters, how they changed. And yeah, here you can see uh, the production curve. In the end, we produced nearly 800 tons of, of, of hydrogen. It's not, of course, not full load because we, we had a, a grid service. We had some stops in between where we got uh, experience, where we improved uh, some things uh, in the plant, but finally in the end we had, as you can see, continuous operation, reliable operation uh, according to, to plan. We got a certificate from TÜV Süd, uh, so the plant is, uh, the hydrogen is produced in a green way according to their uh, requirements. You can see also some parameters. We have uh, 600 cells divided up into 12 modules. The pressure is low. This has an advantage because the amount of hydrogen inside the plant is low. The plant can be visited anytime during operation and uh, there is no uh, safety issue inside. But it has, of course, uh, disadvantages uh, as you have to uh, increase the pressure afterwards. And what is very important, we get 99% 99.9% quality of hydrogen directly out of it without the oxo, without the drying. So the qualities of the plant itself also 
uh, due to the low pressure is very high. Yeah, so what can we say? Stable operation between 1.5 and 6 megawatt. We also did 9 megawatt. So if you consider to have the entire system to, uh, to, to uh, designed to, to 9 megawatt, except the electrolyze itself, you can do this. Yeah? This is possible to, to operate the plant in overload. Uh, we had the plant efficiency about 75% and the stack efficiency up to 83%. Uh, and the plant needs no chemicals, no additional uh, things. If I talk about impurities, I'm talking about traces of oxygen and, and, and humidity. Nothing else inside. And it's flexible operating is possible and the plant even seems to like it to operate in fluctuating mode. And this has a big advantage because we reduced electricity, electricity costs between 25 and 50 percent according to market <coughs> prices. Yeah. Just for the, according to the delivery of, of balancing services. Um, yeah. Large steps in load change is possible also as regards in the future systems, electric arc furnace. And yeah, as a whole, the, the project reached a high visibility. We'll see, still have visitors from all over the world, uh, recently from Japan. Uh, it's, the plant is happy to, to accept you. If you want to come, please come. And yeah, I apply for other people, companies to follow and to, to build this uh, megawatt, 100 megawatt, gigawatt systems to be implemented for us and also for our children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. I mentioned it also yesterday that uh, Age the Future is a really a darling project of mine. Very sorry to see it go. I think the coordinator, the consortium uh, in total, did an excellent job. You didn't quite see uh, too much of the work that uh, the project has done to promote hydrogen to the European energy policy agenda. So you did play an important role, uh, refine as well, the, the big, the big, big projects. So thank you for uh, doing a very good project once more. Um, I would like to remind to people online to use Slido uh, for sending the questions and also invite people in the audience. Mark, Mark Steen, uh, there is a microphone. Of course, yeah. uh, second point, uh, contrary to the previous presentation, you haven't mentioned any problems with balance of plant. Can you yeah. elaborate? <laughs> sure, we had problems with the, the, uh, the uh, uh, for example, uh, f with the analyzer system, analyzing oxygen and hydrogen is not, uh, of obviously not, not uh, state of the art. Uh, the systems are not very uh, stable. Uh, we had some some issues there. Uh, one another part was was a, a design error for, uh, from the cooling section, uh, but this was yeah, just an error. We had to increase the, the area of, of, of heat exchanging. Uh, but but uh, as concerns the electrolyzer itself, we had development steps but we managed them and in the end the plant is operating and is still operating. Uh, we, we have uh, plans for the future. Uh, the main issues are coming from outside. Yeah? So the question from Nikos, <laughs> I don't know, maybe other uh, entities could support outside uh, equipment of the electrolyzer with, with some funding. <laughs> I can get that. Uh, yeah, analyzing systems, um, 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 he, uh, heat exchangers, um, um, uh, equipment from, from the, the water preparation, yeah, 
things that you think they are state of the art and they don't need to be analyzed. But I think maybe you should, if you if you have such a project, you should also have a close look on these systems and on references. So, yeah. Thank you. There is one more question. Hello, Shovan uh, from Senmat. Now, uh, elaborated uh, all projects like this, big ones. Um, I'm always wondering. Uh, you just said to produce the hydrogen at the cheapest price. Do you have any ideas what the levelized cost of hydrogen is in your case, or in the different scenarios in the different modes you're running the electrolyzer? Um, yeah, uh, we went through. Uh, uh, interest, interesting period of time because at the beginning we had COVID with electricity prices at the amount of 20 to 30 euros per megawatt hour and what we are facing now is 380 uh, to 400 euros per megawatt hour so uh, it's difficult to uh, <laughs> in, the best, in the best case in the best case, uh, in the best case uh, no, I give you a range. It's between, let's say, five euro per, t per kilogram to, yeah, now it's 20, more or less, yeah. Thank you. Right. And I remember at the start, there used to be a, a tax exemption in the electricity cost if electricity was to be used for electrolyzers. Did that change in Austria along the way? No, we have still this, this paragraph. Still it, was, it was prolonged, yeah. We, we are exempt from, from, grid, from grid fees uh, if the electricity is uh, dedicated to, to hydrogen production. Right, that's, I think, quite important. Um, if one day we are to drive a steel plant uh, the, with uh, hydrogen, for reducing the, the iron. I've heard that we're gonna be going to gigawatt scale electrolyzers, but if this is to be driven by renewables, you would need big amounts of hydrogen storage. Mm. Where could that be done in Austria? Uh, in Austria, we would need a solution uh, for importing hydrogen, green hydrogen. Uh, there are areas in Europe, also in the southern part of Europe, in windy parts of Europe, uh, northern Africa, where the hydrogen can be produced more easily than in Austria. In Austria, we are uh, quite at the end as regards uh, the, the, the construction of hydropower plants. Uh, so we, uh, an essential part will be needed to be imported. Because to give you a figure, you know maybe the river Danube is the biggest, one of the biggest rivers in, in Europe. It has the biggest slope in Austria and we would need the whole river Danube, uh, all the, the power plants to produce the hydrogen for, for first alpine. So right. it's quite an amount, yeah. Ah, I see there is a question on Slido. Um, Right, okay. It, it would be relevant since you work for Verbund and it's on high electricity prices that seem to have become a problematic theme. Mm -hmm. How do we see a way forward for the program and future projects? Yeah, that's also to yeah. us, I guess, <laughs> but... Uh, I, I, I'm looking desperately at the politicians. <laughs> to change the system. It, the, the current system has a sense because if you, if you uh, pay uh, the, the electricity for the last megawatt hour produced, then it supports uh, wind and solar. But this is now contrary. <laughs> At the moment, we need another model. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a politician. I'm not an economist for, for electricity. But we, I, obviously, we have to change the system for the moment at least. Great, thank you very much once more, Robert. We need to move on. Thank you for this. Ah, sorry, there is... Sorry, yes, one more question, yeah. No, no, it's for the people on the internet. About the purity of the gas, uh, you write 99.9, .9, but uh, it means that uh, in hydrogen, there's uh, 1,000 ppm of oxygen, or no? no? also humidity. Ah, it, oh, it humidity and oxygen. Oxygen is two p uh, a small two amount, p and two small, ppm. Yeah. Small, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. So you dry, so uh, 
you, you dry the hydrogen inside the, the, the stack uh, without a dryer. Have you, uh, have you no, it has, it has 99.9% coming outside from the system, but still there is humidity and, uh, and, and it, oxygen it, inside. Yeah. Ah, okay, inside yeah. this it has... This is 0.1%. Yeah. Okay. We have nothing else. It, we are just using clear water to yes. make oxygen and hydrogen. So it's just humidity and traces of oxygen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks once more. So, uh, right. We heard now two of our large demonstration projects. Like I said, we like these projects to have the right balance of issues and problems. These are innovative electrolyzers. We're not supporting you know, commercial projects here. But we want eventually that the facility works. And we saw indeed a su successful project, the previous one being another example. But we also support research projects where we really try to push the envelope for game-changer electrolyzers. And this is the topic of our next presentation. I'd like to invite Daniel uh, Greenhalk of ITM Power for his presentation on the Neptune project and the great challenges that you faced. Hi, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Greenhouse. I'm uh, a senior research scientist at ITM Power and uh, was Work Package 6 um, coordinator. So um, Neptune was um, addressing the 2017 coal topic Game Changer Water Electrolyzers and began in February of 2018, finishing earlier this year. Uh, it had a budget of just over 1.9 million euros, with the majority of this being provided by the FCHJU. The partners were ITM, uh, who were the project coordinators, uh, Angie, IRD, Solvay, CNR and Protexo. So the aim of the coal topic was to move recent developments from the laboratory level to the engineering stage to disruptively alter electrolysis technology. It sought significant increases in current density, pressure, temperature, uh, along with a decrease in the use of critical raw materials. This meant operating at over 4 amps per square centimetre, at temperatures of over 80 degrees Celsius, and at pressures at or just over 100 bar. New developments could be in both materials and balance of plants, uh, and validated in a system of between 20 and 50 kilowatts in size operating over an extended period of time. The scope of Neptune was to bring the innovative solutions demonstrated in the lab and in previous FCHJU projects from uh, TRL3 to TRL5. The proposal addressed PEM electrolysis specifically, aiming for a step change in performance, operating conditions and system reliability. This slide summarises the major developments in the MEA and the stack components that were expected during the project. Increasing the operating current density will allow for compact design and efficient use of materials, enabling a reduction in capital costs. However, this would be expected to lead to an efficiency uh, loss due to increased ohmic resistance. Therefore, efforts will be focused on increasing the operating temperature and reducing membrane thickness. Reducing membrane thickness will invariably lead to a loss of mechanical stability and an increase in gas crossover, especially when operating at high pressure, and therefore efforts will be made to incorporate reinforcements and recombination catalysts. Improving the activity and stability of electrocatalysts would also be carried out to reduce the use of precious metals in the stack, as well as redesigning stack components to improve performance, durability and reduce costs. Development work on the system would also be carried out with the aim being to optimise the system by, by simplifying the balance of plant and increasing the operating temperature. Along with studies on market readiness, uh, techno-economic analysis and life cycle analysis, the project provided a fairly comprehensive approach to help realise breakthroughs in PEM water electrolysis to promote large scale application of the technology. In terms of partner responsibilities, Solvay were responsible for membrane development, CNR for catalyst development and collating the testing protocols, IRD for the membrane electrode assembly, 
ITM for the stack and the demonstration system, as well as the coordination of the project. Onji focuses on market analysis and techno-economic assessments, and Protexo aided the on dissemination. As I don't have time today to tell you about everything that was achieved during the project, I focused on three aspects that were important. Um, the first being membranes. Uh, Solvay evaluated several equivium-based membranes during the project and used a number of metrics to base their final selection on. The milestone was to produce a reinforced membrane with a low area-specific resistance and hydrogen permeation, meeting the size requirements of the project. Of the reinforced membranes investigated, expanded PTFE reinforced membrane had the uh, ASR meeting the target, but Solvay deemed the readiness level of the manufacturing process not high enough to meet the volume requirements of the project. On the other hand, the extrusion process is a more mature process for them with uh, greater control over the thickness uniformity. Uh, the ASR of, the, of this membrane was just short of meeting the target for the project, uh, and so this was decided um, by the group to be down selected for use in the demonstration system. None of the membranes evaluated, however, were able to achieve the hydrogen crossover target, which meant that a recombination catalyst would need to be utilised if the stack was to operate at 100 bar. As I already mentioned, CNR carried out catalyst development, but they also produced and tested MEA samples. A platinum cobalt core shell recombination catalyst was developed, and different ways of incorporating it into the MEA were investigated. In the gas phase, the catalyst was extremely effective at removing hydrogen from a simulated anode gas stream. However, when incorporating it into the MEA, it wasn't as effective, meaning that the hydrogen crossover target was unable to be achieved. However, in terms of electrochemical performance, the cell voltage at 90 degrees Celsius was not far from the project's target of 1.75 volts, uh, as too was the total catalyst loading for the MEA. Unfortunately, scale-up of the ultra-low catalyst-loaded MEAs and maintenance of the high performance proved to be a challenge. Uh, in, com in comparison to the results from CNR, the large-scale MEAs produced by IRD appeared to suffer from catalyst activation issues. This was thought to be associated with the different deposition methods used to form the composite anode. Uh, to get a better understanding of, of this, the catalyst loadings were increased to compensate for the activation losses, and this was found to reduce the performance gap, and therefore these loadings were chosen by the group to be used in the large-scale demonstration. Despite this result, the, previous, the, the overall precious metal loading represented a 50% reduction compared to the state-of-the-art. A cell containing this MEA with the recombination catalyst in a mixed configuration with the anode catalyst achieved the, de the degradation target of the project, which was to operate over 2,000 hours at 4 amps per square centimetre at 90 degrees. The third aspect I want to discuss is the stack design. For this project, ITM developed a new stack module with a flow field free design to eliminate expensive machining costs and compensate for, uh, and a composite cell plate assembly. The stack was designed to act as a pressure vessel, so pressurizing to save energy and costs in compression of gases, and used a low cost single acting hydraulic cylinder to provide compression to the stack module rather than using traditional tie rods. The materials of construction were chosen to allow the stack temperature to operate above 80 degrees and mechanical testing to 1.5 times the working pressure demonstrated that the stack design was capable of operating at 100 bar. Uh, however, even with the presence of the recombination catalyst, the MEA's hydrogen permeability meant that the stack could not be operated above 70 bar um, at the project's nominal current density without the level of hydrogen and oxygen increasing above the safety limit of 2 volume per cent. To provide a reasonable wide range of operation, therefore, a compromise would have to be made in, in terms of either temperature or pressure uh, with this uh, MEA. In terms of major challenges for the project, like most, the pandemic had a significant impact affecting the second half of Neptune. COVID-related delays meant the final stages of the project also coincided with ITM moving to a new facility, which led to further disruption. 
Despite these challenges, the stack and demo system were successfully designed, procured and assembled, but the final stack testing was significantly limited. To mitigate this, the scaled up MEAs were fully characterized at a single cell level and the system verified using a reference stack. In terms of the lessons learned, the project has indicated potential for optimization, but scale up remains a challenge. In, uh, as for exploitation, partners have been able to acquire new knowledge in key areas and the impact of the project will be to allow market opportunities to be exploited, uh, such as in transport, energy storage and power to gas applications, uh, and provide sustainable hydrogen production to meet the demand for energy applications from local carbon sources. To keep people up to speed with progress on the project, there was a website and a number of newsletters. There were numerous public reports covering uh, a range of topics uh, during the project, the six publications in internationally recognized journals, and partners presented at several international conferences. There was an online workshop organized last year in partnership with Pretzel Project, which was also a game changer project. And this event was well attended, had speakers from other projects working in areas uh, contributing in step changes in performance. Finally, all that remains for me to say is thank you to the FCHJU for their support during the project and thank you to you for listening. Thank you, Daniel, for the presentation. Indeed, very challenging project going up to 100 bar. And yesterday I mentioned that uh, later on, our calls for proposals for highly pressurized um, electrolyzers went down from 50 to 80 bar, following the experiences of these two projects as well. Any questions for Daniel from uh, the audience, perhaps? Mark Steen and then Robert. Can you elaborate on the considerations for the compromise temperature, I think it's a compromise temperature of 80 degrees. What are the conflicting points of view to arrive at this 80 degrees? Why is this an optimum? Uh, eight, 80 degrees was uh, the cold topic challenge set. Okay, so it's, it's a given. It's top down, a given. You have not done any investigations trying to optimize it. What? No, uh, state of the arts uh, typically around 60. Um, we were given the challenge to operate at 80 to try and improve efficiency to achieve um, a, a system efficiency of 80% uh, and a stack efficiency of around 85%. So. Okay, but I have seen that it's not 90. Well, that was, uh, we were trying to achieve better than what the target was set for the cold topic. Robert Bornsteiner from Verbund. Uh, are you considering changing iridium with other elements, no, no, no seldom elements? Changing the iridium? Iridium, yes. Uh, well, this uh, catalyst was developed actually from a previous FCHJU project, um, uh, HPEMS Gas, and um, the same partner was, uh, CNR was uh, part of this project. Um, so the, their route was to look at reducing loadings um, of, of this particular active catalyst. I think um, if we're looking to reduce loadings, perhaps uh, future uh, research should look at uh, alternatives to uh, supported catalysts rather than the unsupported that were used during the project. Uh, iridium is uh, uh, one of the most active elements for oxygen evolution. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think uh, going down the supported catalyst route is probably the, the way to go for the time being. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. And there is uh, one more question here in the audience. Thank you, uh, Andrea Fasolini from the University of Bologna. I have a kind of similar question, so sorry for that, regarding the platinum cobalt catalyst. 
So I wanted uh, to ask you if it is possible to reduce a lot the amount of platinum in the catalyst, which I guess it will reduce the cost. And if, in general, if adding cobalt has some effect on the stability of the catalyst, if, if you have these informations, of course. Well, the, uh, the use of the cobalt there was to uh, try and combat the risk of platinum oxidation, uh, as that was um, a risk for the recombination catalyst. In terms of state of the art, the, the, uh, as I showed uh, at the time, um, it was around two and a half um, milligrams per centimeter squared total loading. So uh, we have reduced the platinum content uh, considerably, 50% uh, compared to the state of the art at the time. Um, it's possible you could go lower on the on the cathode side, um, but it uh, becomes a challenge then in terms of uh, electrical conduction, uh, and so yeah, I, I guess it's uh, we're getting pretty close, I think, to the uh, the limit at the moment um, using the uh, the way of applying catalysts to uh, membranes. Thank you, Daniel. There is one more question. Let's take this one, even though we are running a bit late from Slido. Can you elaborate how do you reinforce the membranes and what does reinforced mean? Uh, yes, um, reinforcement means uh, using a support structure. So typically these types of membranes are cast so that uh, ionomer is in a solution form that's applied to the reinforcement structure and then the membranes are uh, the solvents from these solutions is, are evaporated to leave you with the ionomer embedded within the reinforcement. Great. Thank you very much once more, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. So, we've seen, we've uh, heard three projects on uh, low temperature electrolyzers. It was all PEM, actually. But now we're moving to the last presentation, which is a high temperature electrolyzer project. And it's, I believe, the largest solid oxide electrolyzer in the world that uh, Project Multiply is going to be developing. Julie Mouguin is going, the coordinator is going to give us a presentation on this. Good morning. So indeed, we will um, heat up a bit <laughs> with the high temperature electrolysis. So I'm Julie Mougin from CA in France and coordinating multiplied projects. Next slide is here. So the project has been awarded uh, at the call of 2019. It started 1st of January 2020 and should end <coughs> after six years end of 2024. So it intends to install indeed the, the biggest high temperature electrolyzer in a refinery. So you see here the list of the partners. So Sunfire is the developer and provider of the high temperature electrolysis technologies. Polviot is the provider of the hydrogen processing unit. Both uh, systems will be installed at Neste refinery in Rotterdam, but also Finnish uh, teams from Neste are also participating. NG from France is in charge of the techno-economic assessment as well as the purchase of the renewable electricity and also takes care of the certified effort. And CA is coordinating in charge of the dissemination but also in charge of some stack testing at lab level. So overall the project is about 60% in terms of implementation. Total budget is a bit below 10 million with the support from the FCHGU, now Clean Hydrogen Partnership, of 7 million. And the rest of the financial contribution is provided by the industrial partners. So what are the main targets of the project? As said by Nikos, the main goal is to manufacture, install, and integrate the world's first high temperature electrolyzer at the megawatt scale. Uh, reaching at the end of the project a TRL of 8. So it will be the world's largest HTE unit uh, by a factor of 3 as compared to the unit currently installed in Salzgitter in Germany which is 720 kilowatts. And it will be for the first time in a refinery in charge of producing renewable product as I said in Rotterdam. So maybe for those who are not so much familiar with high temperature electrolysis I can elaborate a bit about the interest of this technology. 
you can see on the graph on the left side that the main interest is that when we split wa a steam molecule rather than water molecule, we have a gain in the energy consumption. And if in addition you increase the temperature, you can replace some electricity demand by heat. And in case you have the chance to be in an industrial site where there is some fatal heat available, then you can really win some um, efficiency points. Just to give you an order of magnitude, um, high temperature, the share between electricity and heat is 70-30, while, while at low temperature is 85-15. And you will see afterwards it has a direct impact on the overall efficiency. And just keep in mind that this uh, technology operates generally between 700 and 850 degrees, which is very high. Um, and which allows, however, to avoid completely uh, the use of expensive noble catalysts, which is also a difference compared to what has been said before. And um, this technology is completely modular, you will see afterwards, and then it's a good point to further scale up uh, in the next future. So more in detail, uh, the quantified objectives. So we uh, install a system which is about 2.6 megawatt, including the electrolyzer and the hydrogen processing unit. We will be able to produce a, a bit more 60 kilogram of hydrogen per hour, and we intend to operate the system in field uh, about uh, 16,000 hours, which will lead to a substantial decrease of the greenhouse gas emission um, uh, of the plant. Um, you see here the value of electrical efficiency which is targeted, 85% LHV, which corresponds to an electricity consumption at nominal capacity of 39 kilowatt hour per kilogram. We would like to demonstrate a very good availability above 98% and also a very low production loss below 1.2% per 1,000 hours, fully aligned with the multi-annual work plan targets. So besides those technical objectives, we have some economic objectives targeting to decrease strongly the capital cost and the OPEX cost uh, aligned with the MOP. Uh, in order to evaluate this, we have some techno-economic assessment and uh, we expect that uh, it will pave the way for further upscaling step to the 100 megawatt scale. And um, besides uh, we have a few societal objectives, uh, we expect to increase the awareness of these high temperature electrolysis technologies as being viable for energy intensive industries. We will take care of the procurement strategy for renewable energy, electricity, and we will, uh, for the first time, certify green hydrogen produced uh, by high temperature electrolysis with the certified methodology. So now some results. Um, I said before that we have uh, some stack long-term testing in the laboratory which complement uh, the infield test that we will be performed. And in the project, we investigated two technologies. First, electrolyte supported cell, the one from Sunfire. A tower of two stacks made of 30 cells has been tested. And another type of stack, cathode supported cell provided by CA, has been also evaluated with a single stack of 25 cells. So both of them have been operated at the thermoneutral voltage. We fixed the current density, which means that we fixed the hydrogen production. And we, in case we face a degradation, increase the temperature to compensate the potential degradation. So you see on the left hand side the results on the two stacks. So we successfully tested both of them, uh, respectively 6,800 hours and 8,200 hours. And we succeeded with this operation strategy to keep the current for this long duration. That means without any hydrogen production loss. So which fulfilled completely the targets we set below 1.2. So what about the module manufacturing and installation? At the beginning of the project, uh, Sunfire has what they call the generation one, 36 stack modules, 133 kilowatts. And uh, in between, they developed a generation two made of 60 stacks, 230 kilowatts. And those new generation two modules are the one considered for multiply. Multiply will be made of 12 modules of 60 stacks, each of these 230 kilowatts. 
What is the status? Uh, so far, five modules have been uh, manufactured and successfully tested in terms of uh, factory acceptance tests. They completely reached the target of uh, more than 60 um, normal cubic meter of hydrogen per hour. And the temperature and voltage are very homogeneous in the stacks. Two of them are already installed uh, at Neste in Rotterdam. You see the picture on the left and the manufacture of the remaining modules is in progress as planned. Uh, for the hydrogen processing unit, um, again, uh, the background of this project was a green eye 2.0 with uh, an equipment uh, able to operate with 18 kilogram hour of hydrogen at 12 bars. Now we go up to 60 kilogram hour of hydrogen at 30 bars and Polvut uh, developed or integrated the different key components, which means hydrogen buffer tank, hydrogen compressor, hydrogen dryer, air cooler, chiller, and quality monitoring device online. The status is that all components have been manufactured and successfully uh, tested in terms of factory acceptance tests, and all of them have been delivered and installed in the refi refinery. You see especially on the picture on the left, the compressor. And last, uh, the site and demonstration preparation. So Neste is obviously in charge of this. They have performed all the engineering work and the site preparation is ongoing for a startup in Q1 2023 as planned. Uh, beside this, uh, a service and maintenance concept has been defined in order to see how to operate the, the, the system. The sourcing of the renewable electricity is planned and the work on the guarantee of origin for hydrogen in relation with Certify and the local Dutch system is ongoing. And especially the consortium was very active in um, uh, participating in the draft methodology for greenhouse gas avoidance with Certify Working Group 2. It has been adopted at this level and should be validated by the Working Group 1 end of 2022. So risk challenges and lessons learned. So as said uh, by, the, by the previous project, the COVID impacted the project with some delays, uh, but a contingency plan has been put it in place by the, the, the partners and uh, it gave uh, the, the following uh, action. Manufacture shipment and installation of two modules first, as you could have seen, and the rest beginning of 2023. And um, in order to take care of what could happen when we implement new technology in a, a very uh, old industry, as said by the first presenter, we have a detailed risk management in place, in place with a good planning for the installation and commissioning, and so far the risk has uh, um, mastered. Uh, we also intended in the project to evaluate a third party stack for the benchmark. We did not succeed so far to purchase one, so we decided to replace it by a new stack design provided by Sunfire. So last, uh, exploitation. So as you could have seen from my introduction, all the partners are um, placed on the value chain. So there is a good complementarity, each of them having its own stone. And regarding the impact, uh, we started a preliminary market analysis with some sales forecast for each individual component which paved the road for the, the end of the project. And last part, um, dissemination. So we have a website with quite a large number of visitors so far. It is updated uh, regularly with newsletter and leaflets, so please visit it. We had the opportunity to present the project um, this summer at the European Fuel Cell Forum conference at the CA booth, and the presentation has been given there. And we also prepared a video to present the, the project uh, concept. So if we can maybe uh, send a video just to show it to you.
Julie. Now there is already a question in Slido um, on how does the temperature increase that you mentioned uh, in the stacks affect the efficiency of the overall system? Okay. So that is of course something that will be really recorded when the system will be operated because in lab we are not taking care of this extra consumption. But the idea is really to have just a kind of um, very short term um, heating and then afterwards since we operate at thermal neutral voltage it does not mean we will uh, continue to continuously um, heat the system. So it will be some spikes I would say and then it's become more, uh, let's say, nominal operation. But come back next year and we will check the efficiency together. <laughs> Great. And a comment from my side, I think you could use some of the architects that we have in our low temperature electrolysis projects in, in your project as well. I think the uh, sheds were designed by a chemical engineer, not uh, an architect. Yeah. Right. Okay, so question from the audience. Catalysts you mentioned, you said no, no expensive platinum group metals, but the question is also, are these critical materials um, according to the Europe European Union? So what kind of catalyst are you using? Okay, so I can maybe uh, describe how the cell looks like. So the electrolyte is a um, um, solid electrolyte made of YSZ, which is heteria stabilized zirconia, so that means zirconium, yttrium, and oxygen. Uh, we have the cathode, which is nickel YZ, so nickel, yttria, uh, zirconium, and uh, oxygen. And the oxygen electrode is made of um, a perovskite oxide, lantan, strontium, cobalt, iron. So the only one I could say would be cobalt. <laughs> but it's a small layer. Uh, roughly the thickness of this layer is 30 microns. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I have actually two questions. The first one is quite short. What kind of heat source are you using? Is it a renewable heat source or so? And the second question is, uh, can you comment on the, on the thermal cyclability of the system? Do you have to keep it on hot standby all the time when no wind and no solar energy is uh, available? Okay. So first, for the heat source, uh, it's, um, it could depend on the site, but here we take the steam which is already available on site and which is um, coming partly, but not fully, from a fossil source and partly also from renewable source. And that's why I mentioned that we are integrated in the certified working group for the greenhouse gases avoidance and the source of steam is something which is um, considered for this working group. So you're perfectly right, we take care of this. And then for the cyclability, um, that's obvious that we cannot have a cold start very quick as compared to other technologies. So in, term, in case we are uh, coupled with the renewable electricity, it's better to have a hot standby or let's say partly hot standby. But in case we forecast a long period with no operation, then we can, however, shut down the modules and then restart them with some hours. Yeah. Indeed, and that's, that's an important point in terms of where eventually will such systems be, be finding application. And I heard once in the US, well, they thinking of integrating <coughs> them with nuclear power plants. Yes where you have rather stable operation, you have heat, mm -hmm. electricity, <coughs> and such systems could be very well integrated. Yes. Right, then uh, no more questions. Uh, thank you very much again, Julie. And maybe I can ask you to... <laughs> so invite our speakers to join me here in the panel as well as uh, Joris Prost. And I hope we still have Anders in, uh, online, somewhere in, in Norway. So, as of this year, the program review days have been expanded uh, into uh, hydrogen research days. 
And our aim now is also to involve researchers from outside our little bubble uh, to help us and comment upon on whether we are on the right path, are we inclusive enough, should we, should we be doing something else. We're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Joris Prost from the Catholic University of Louvain uh, with us. I have collaborated in the past with Joris and I know his activities at the international level, IEA, Hydrogen uh, TCP. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Joris. And maybe we can start, if you can briefly present yourself and tell us um, of your activities in this field, and more importantly, how do you fund these activities? Okay, thank you, Nikos. Um, I, I do like the word bubble. It seems a, a word that has received from the COVID pandemic, so I'm indefinitely outside the bubble, huh? uh, in the sense that uh, I don't have any projects that are directly funded by the, the Clean uh, Hydrogen Partnership. Um, so uh, my own activity, um, uh, I started as a metallurgical engineer, and um, that's something I like to stress because um, as a metallurgical engineer from a couple of decades ago, uh, when you talk about electrometallurgy, the only thing that you want to avoid is hydrogen. Uh, you don't want hydrogen on your electrodes because you don't recuperate or deposit your, your metals at that time. So I, th I guess that when, when, when you learn something, how to avoid it, you can also use it later to make it. Huh? So that, that is uh, how I came into this field. Um, and then, um, as an early believer, um, uh, I got maybe 20 years ago, I got the chance to have a, a pilot funded, an, an alkaline electrolyzer pilot funded in my lab. It's a six kilowatt um, electrolyzer. So I, I do appreciate balance of plant issues on a six megawatt scale. Huh? So we have also quite some issues running on small scale electrolyzers and I think it's really an important part of the whole picture. Uh, uh, it's just on a smaller scale but we, we can really appreciate all these, all these issues. Um, now um, I'm located in Belgium, the Belgian government has been quite late in taking up the hydrogen but now they're full speed and so um, I'm also part of a Belgian initiative that regroups all the universities in Belgium. Uh, we joined PhDs working on hydrogen, which makes kind of a very nice network within the academic field. And recently we have also a project on which is called MUSE and Molecules at Sea, where uh, the Belgian government also wants to look more closely at offshore hydrogen production. And I do have a European project funded in the framework of the H2020, the framework program, which is, uh, by the way, also with NEL, so it has a, a, an industrial uh, component and it's uh, uh, coordinated by DTU. Um, and another project I'm in is in the um, European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Uh, I do believe that uh, as a university we also need to make sure that we start to educate our engineers, uh, metallurgical engineers, also towards the hydrogen field because I think in the end, maybe in 10 or 20 years, these are the ones that need to do uh, the, 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 the real work um, uh, in the field. Uh, so that is a uh, background on my activities. Um, and then indeed uh, I've been rather active in the International Energy Agency as well with the Technology Collaboration Program. Um, and so I've had the chance to participate or being invited as an, uh, an external reviewer in one of the more seminal reports that the International Agency has, has come up with. Uh, I want to point out that within the International Agency, hygiene was for long also, I mean, not really on the radar, huh? so they have picked up quite late. 2019 was their first report, so I, I do believe that uh, the European Commission has been much earlier huh, in anticipating this, this as, a, as, a, as a particular field of interest. Um, and so I have read quite some reports there as a reviewer. The advantage is that you have to read all these reports as well. And so I was really impressed by the amount of data that, that have been gathered or can be gathered worldwide, not only in Europe, but also what's happening in other countries, Japan, Korea, and United States. So I think from that, that makes, brings me here also from, from, that, from that perspective. Let me say also that uh, uh, in the framework of this um, uh, International Energy Agency, um, I have been involved rather actively in kind of trying to mapping, and that was I think in uh, 2020, yes, kind of mapping all the demonstration projects that were at the time running across the world. Right. And um, it was clear from, from, from this exercise, and it was quite elaborate exercise, that uh, by far most of half of these demonstration projects were happening in Europe. Huh? So this, this was clearly, I think, uh, a nice outcome of, 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 of what Europe has been uh, funding uh, before. Um, I am a strong believer of the European 
idea, and I do think also that um, hydrogen might be a nice or a, a very prominent European story huh, to, uh, to bring uh, the European uh, uh, economy uh, and to keep, it, to keep it on the agenda. And I think that one of the, the, the nice things I appreciate also, and then I will be more critical, I, I first want to <laughs> congratulate you before being maybe more critical on some of the of the of the issues, I do think also that uh, part, uh, talking about clean hydrogen rather than green hydrogen is a good move. I think that uh, people might be more attracted by the word clean, meaning that it might also have a direct impact on their health huh? um, rather than being green. Maybe people do not care that much about CO2 emissions, but when you say that they come hand in hand with particle reduction or all kinds of uh, NOx uh, things that are being reduced so I think clean hydrogen is really a nice move also to uh, to bring it closer to the to the daily use so that's uh, an introduction I wanted to do right thank you thank you about this and um, yeah I mean we are looking globally at uh, this RIA that we we have um, Maybe you also went through my overview presentation. You heard today the, the four presentations. First of all, maybe you want to ask for additional information from our four presenters. And then maybe you wish to elaborate on whether we're missing something or there are areas. Then these are maybe less prevalent, but if you go off grid, um, I think that uh, you can now make with off-grid renewable electricity, green hydrogen, at the cost which is cheaper than eight euro per kilogram. So I think that maybe at the start of this project in 2017, 2018, grid balancing was maybe one way to try to get money out of the, the green hydrogen by, by providing grid services. Um, I have the impression now that relying on the grid is maybe not a, a nice thing to have for the moment. And, and so, um, and this is only within a two years change. Huh? So if we want to go for zero in 2050, knowing that things have changed quite a bit in two years, I, I think that one should make more abstraction of the price or the cost of the green hydrogen as an absolute value and try, huh? um, I'm from the Catholic University of Louvain, we, we, we have a saying that don't try to be more Catholic than the Pope, huh? um, uh, try to, to, to not stick to that value as such, but more in a relative way. So maybe a question then is that after evaluation, the, the two first projects, what is your feeling about Thank this grid balancing service as an added value? I, I think for the moment it's maybe more working uh, on the negative side and being trying to make it off-grid would be on Thank the long you. term more, let's say, uh, cost safe and even allow you to be cheaper than SMR hydrogen. Yes, I wonder if uh, our two large electrolyzer projects have considered at some point to going off-grid. Maybe I start with, with an answer. Uh, yes, it, it, we have also, of course, other projects that we are following and, and uh, indeed uh, connecting to an off-grid plant is an issue, is an option. Uh, however, you have to consider also that you have additional costs due to the construction of the, of the wind uh, farm or, or the solar plant. So in this case, um, it, it, it's... Uh, for the, at first, in the first step, not really helping the, 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 the costs to, to decrease. Uh, however, if you think, if thinking of, of, of the far future, we have the task to increase essentially the capacity uh, of, of, of renewable electricity itself. Uh, so, uh, for example, in Austria, we uh, have to, to increase the capacity of wind by a factor of nine. So to to to, uh, to to nine um, uh, times that then in uh, in the current uh, capacity and and uh, in for as regards uh, solar in the, by the fact of twelve. So yeah, this is also a huge step to be taken. This is hindering somehow uh, the the development of a hydrogen economy. And therefore, at, for the first, as a first step, you can think of regions where uh, grids are not so well developed and where you can connect directly 
to, a, to a renewable plant where you can uh, get electricity at a cheaper price. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Anders, um, any thoughts of perhaps directly connecting to renewables? I don't know how much wind and sun there is in Cologne. Anders can hear us? I, I guess not. And in this case, I'm going to turn to a colleague. Ah, so Anders, can you hear us? No? Can you hear us, Anders? One, two. Oh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Ah, yeah, sorry, because uh, I couldn't hear you for five minutes now. So. Uh, Okay. There was a question then, probably. <laughs> the topic was whether the project considered connecting the electrolyzer directly to renewable energy sources in order to avoid the today's very high costs in electricity. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, that's uh, that's a big challenge now, especially on the continent. I'm sitting in an area with. Uh, very lucky low uh, prices. I think it's about one hundredth of uh, what you experience down there. But uh, we can't move all electrolyzers up to the northern part of Norway. Uh, I guess we might have talked about also the availability of renewable electricity. It's not always easy and especially not uh, in, in uh, areas where perhaps the hydrogen is needed. So uh, that is uh, that is for sure a challenge, and I guess that's also why many are looking into areas further away and uh, transporting hydrogen. Then again, that's a cost issue. So you mentioned it uh, after the presentation of H2 Future, I think, about the gigawatt um, installations needed, and um, yeah, uh, other places to to produce this hydrogen that is uh, an issue and then again also this dynamic operation of, uh, of renewables uh, that's one issue uh, not only the electrolyzer we talked about issues with balance of plant and then also connecting this to an end user if you have uh, like then a steel plant or a refinery uh, if the production goes much up and down can you also adjust these processes according to this or do you need a buffer system in a way that's uh, another point which which needs to be addressed and uh, yeah several several challenges here and uh, i made a note during the introduction to this panel session that uh, we just need to continue to build further new large plants to gain more experience. Uh, now the 10 from our side has been built. We hope to build now the 100 megawatt, but in all technologies, it was very interesting to hear about the high temperature presentation. Uh, developments there, I had a question on balance of plant experience and availability. Um, it would also be nice to exchange on that. Uh, yeah, Several issues and questions which need to be answered. <laughs> Right. Th thank you, Anders. And uh, yeah, you were very right. Um, and you brought me to uh, your colleague, Federico Zenit, who is in the room with us today, the coordinator of the EOLUS project. This is exactly a 2.5 megawatt PEM electrolyzer directly linked to a wind park, but it is at the very tip of Norway. And the question is where to use the hydrogen. Of course, this is what uh, they are trying to do now. On the other hand, a little complaint from our side is that we did have a topic uh, a year ago, uh, or in a recent call, on a renewable electrolyzer integrated system, and we received no proposals in that. That was a great disappointment, uh, and maybe we'll come back to this later. But Maybe, Joris, we can go to your second point. I think the very important point when you mentioned about cost and how we could look at integrated renewable electrolyzer systems. Okay, yeah, the, the maybe the, on this cost issue, and this is a message I try to, to give whenever I have a chance. Um, <laughs> 
And I personally believe that when, when, when you compare this green hydrogen with, uh, with uh, the SMR hydrogen, the, the maybe the forgotten opportunity is that up till now, most people were buying their hydrogen. Eh? And so they have to buy SMR hydrogen. And, and I'm not an economist, but there, do, there is a clear difference between price and cost. Eh? So whenever you are now able to produce it yourself, because you have an electrolyzer, which is far easy, I mean, eh? operationally, there are some difficulties, but you can plug in, in with electricity, you are able on a relatively small scale to make your own hydrogen so that you don't have to buy it. So even if there is a difference in cost, the SMR hydrogen is even sold at a price which is higher than two euros per kilogram. And people tend to forget that. So making it yourself is an opportunity also to bridge that gap. But making it, you should include the cost of your wind turbine as well. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I think that there are some cases there, but anyway, I will not dwell on that there. Um, then the, the second one, when maybe this was a question I wanted to ask also during the presentation. Uh, I think it was mentioned in, in both of the first two presentations, and I think these were very nice projects where they are actually producing uh, their own hydrogen for their own use. Uh, so I think this is, this is a, nice, uh, a nice starting point. Um, the, the green hydrogen is very pure, 99.9%. Uh, uh, with only humidity as an impurity. Um, the, the, the price of the SMR hydrogen is not including the additional purification that you need to get there. Huh? So I, I do think that there is an opportunity if you choose well the final use of the hydrogen to even allow for a small surplus in cost of your green hydrogen, knowing that it is much purer. So, so my questions would be even in the refinery level or maybe in the steel factory, what are the uses that you envisage for this very pure hydrogen? Is it just mixing in with existing hydrogen pipelines with SMR, or is it going to be used for a dedicated process where this extremely pure hydrogen could be an added value as such in the synthesis or in the steel making? Well, I guess uh, our projects and the particular industrial applications do not require very high purity of hydrogen. You inject it in coke oven gas, you use it in a refining process, uh, multiply as well would be a refining process as well. So there, yeah. Um, currently, uh, our hydrogen is, is uh, produced at the low pressure level, so it's just to give a figure, what, just 100 millibar coming out of the plant. So you, we can just put it into a pipeline and mix it with current systems. Uh, but in the future, we want to add a purification unit. We want to add the, the oxo and also add a, a drying unit uh, to make it available for other systems. Uh, as the plant is way too small for our steel production plant, uh, we will make it available for outside consumers. We are situated in the city of Linz. There are buses driving in the city of Linz, so this will be an option across the street. There is another chemical uh, industry company uh, needing hydrogen. So we are thinking of, of other options. Uh, according to purity, uh, and this is definitely an issue, and this could also be a hint to, to certify, because we thought of uh, certifying our hydrogen according to certify uh, quality, but they said they need guaranteed 99.9% uh, .9 as this is the quality traded at the moment. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But for at, uh, we can reach the quality of 99.9%, .9 but not at all, uh, all uh, um, let's say, if we, if we pl at, at all loads, if we, uh, if we operate the plant at partial load, we will be 99.7 uh, or lower percent, and this is a, a criteria we cannot follow according to certify, so we change to, to, to suit. Uh, and uh, I think this is an important issue because uh, in the future there are consumers that do not need 99.9% in the steel industry, for mm -hmm. example, for, for uh, producing uh, in, in the direct uh, reduction units. Uh, we 
they need just 97, 96 percent. Yeah, they have other other uh, obligations to follow uh, some criteria. So maybe this is a hint for for certified to think that uh, high consumers maybe need uh, low lower qualities, and this should be also able to certify as a green hydrogen. That's a good point. My colleague Dionysius Tsimis is here in the audience and uh, he's taking notes, I'm sure. So, yeah, thank you. Maybe, uh, Joris, if you agree, since we have another five to uh, ten minutes, yeah. you want to elaborate on yeah. the other two points? Yeah, the, the, my own, and I, I, well, as I was supposed to give some, some external view, I, I, I do sometimes, as a chemical engineer, I, I, it's really a pity that you see that you produce this very clean hydrogen and then it's blended in with other qualities of hydrogen. It's really a loss of a very rich chemical molecule. Eh? If, if, as a chemical engineer, you make something that is 99.9% .9 clear and then you mix it in with something which is 97, you are almost crying. It's like, <laughs> it's like it's a loss and the, there is value in there. And I agree it's not for all and probably for steel making it's not needed. But this is also a way to valorize the maybe additional costs the fact that it's clear, it could you give you a better end product. I, I think it's sometimes overlooked, so that, that is a point that I wanted to make. Um, I'm having the impression that I may be forgetting about the two other projects, so I, I try to make a, a small jump there. Um, and I was happy with, uh, the, with the high temperature project in the sense that uh, often in chemical industry, uh, people really are replacing in, in a process diagram uh, uh, or a block diagram the SMR hydrogen with green hydrogen. And they forget that SMR hydrogen comes out of the reactor at, at 500 degrees. And they put in a green hydrogen and then, of course, the whole process flow is killed because the green hydrogen comes out at room temperature and you, for your process you might want to bring it up. So I think this is a nice example, maybe not specifically on the electrolyzer production and the higher efficiency, but for its, its, um, its promises to be integrated in a broader picture uh, to go into synthetic fuels or to go into ammonia production. People tend to forget that Haber-Bosch is a high temperature process, so when you plug it in with a low temperature electrolyzer, you still have to do quite some <laughs> work to add it to the high temperature. So I, I think that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that this is a, a, an important consideration. Maybe I would, I would just dwell on, on, on the last topic and, and not use its scale, but um, uh, I, I got interested myself in the fabrication, the manufacturability. Huh? So, um, um, uh, I have seen myself at the company a stack being assembled with, with three or four technicians taking electrodes and membranes and making sure that uh, that all the, the, the holes were aligned well. So I think that there is there is still room for automatization and, and I work myself on 3D printing technologies, but uh, that's, that's, that's another issue. But I think that manufacturability might be, might be coming up. So maybe I would, I would invite the, the two other projects which are still uh, on game-changing concepts to comment maybe on, on manufacturability of, of their system one, once it could be uh, in the field for, for, for going to higher powers. Yeah, in, on, in terms of ITM, um, currently um, things are, as you described, uh, hand-built, but the efforts looking at ways that we can um, automate certain processes, uh, I think it is possible, uh, and that will certainly increase the production rate uh, to meet the uh, ever-growing demand uh, that's uh, at the moment. Um, so, yeah, there, there are certain aspects that I think can be automated, um, MEA production, um, uh, and certain assembly um, tasks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the answer is almost the same for high temperature electrolysis. Um, some stack manufacturers already consider some automatic steps in the assembly. And for the cell manufacturing, so the ceramic cell manufacturing, it's not necessarily automatic, but the players try to, let's say, um, upscale the capacity, especially for the thermal treatment, the sintering, and so on, with some more automatic uh, flows. So that's uh, also a challenge, and the techno-economic assessment that has been done in, in Multiply, but also more generally, shows that the cost reduction curve is impressively related to automation mm -hmm. and the uh, economy of scale. So that's key also for this technology. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question to Daniel. 
Sorry for putting you on the spot, but you are our only electrolyzer OEM representative here. Uh, we are observing that the various companies that we've been supporting in the past who grew and I think now are flying off the nest, it's, it's hard, uh, I've heard it yesterday as well, it's hard for uh, other companies to approach you for you to join proposals. Is it right that because there is now bigger demand for electrolyzers, is it right that within the companies people are being moved to the production lines and there is not too much attention paid to research and development in the electrolysis field? Um, no, it's certainly not the case. There's a reduction in uh, focus. There's always um, the need to improve performance, um, durability, reduce costs. That, in fact, the reducing costs is uh, quite a key area, really. Um, so uh, maybe not in terms of uh, game changer and pushing the boundaries of performance, maybe consolidating what we have to date and looking at ways to reduce the costs that are involved with achieving those um, targets that we've got now uh, is, is more the focus of, of R&D. Um, so, as in terms of for ITM's perspective, you no, know, there's still an intense focus on R&D, um, but we're looking to scale up the technology to meet the, the demand uh, and reduce costs to make the uh, technology more attractive. Right. Yeah, yeah. And we do hope we'll be seeing the more of you. Hopefully, this Brexit issue will somehow also be uh, arranged so we can still have you in our projects. And with this, I would like to thank again our panelists. Uh, thanks very much, Joris, for, for joining us here, and all our four panelists. And uh, yeah, I'd like to ask for a round of applause. Thank you also for participating and your questions. And I think it's time for our coffee break.